Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound podcast channel about electronic music and all things synth. I'm Rob Perichelli and in this podcast I talk to Ian Boddy, who has been a fixture on the electronic music scene for over 40 years, whether it's as an artist, a sound designer or a label owner. That label, DIN, celebrates its 100th release this month with one of Ian's own creations, Nevermore. I wanted to find out more about this niche label, why and how it started, and how it still remains a relevant and popular imprint to this day. But first, I wanted to understand more about Ian's musical roots, so I asked him where it all began for him. Gosh, well, um, I suppose I got into liking electronic music, which is such a huge uh, genre. Anyhow, it was in the uh, mid-70s. I remember Alan Freeman on BBC Radio 1 on a Saturday afternoon, can you believe? That's like really mainstream. He played um, the wonderfully titled Mysterious Semblance at the Strand of Nightmares by Tangerine Dream from the album Phaedra. And I'm sitting there, I don't know, was I 15 or so? I had my little tape recorder, you know, on the off chance a good track came up to record it. And it was like, what is this? This is like nothing I've ever heard before it, it barely sounded like human beings had made this. It came from another another uh, planet, and I think shortly after that, there's a little local radio station, uh, uh, Bridges, it was called, on Metro Radio, played some uh, Cloud Schultz of Time Wind uh, at one a.m. after the news. Didn't even tell the audience what it was called. I think it was the only time I've ever phoned up a radio station to find out what something was called. It was called Time Wind, and I immediately rushed off to buy that as well. So those those two tracks. Played on relatively mainstream, uh, um, you know, which is not something that's probably going to happen these days. That's when I first registered what electronic music could do in terms of painting pictures and sounds, as a phrase I often use, Take, taking it to other worlds where your imagination can uh, run off with itself. And then um, I didn't do um, music at all when I was young. I didn't particularly like it. I, I, I did art. I was I was quite good at art and science. So... I think if you're good at art, you're good at art. And I remember doing uh, art in my spare time when I was doing my uh, A-level science uh, courses. Of course, all the uh, career teachers said, no, you don't want to do art. No, you're never going to make any money out of art. You should do science. So off I trooped to uh, Newcastle University to do biochemistry. And whilst I was there, I discovered a wonderful place called Spectro Arts Workshop, which was like an open open access, it had photography studios, an art uh, gallery, cafe, screen printing, and I could do my art there, I could do screen printing, and that was great fun until one of my friends at university went, you do you, you do know there's a sound studio upstairs who've got kind of that gear, that, that weird stuff that you have listened to, they've got those sort of things, and I'm like, have they? So I literally walked up the concrete staircase, opened this studio door to be confronted by VCS3s, Revox tape recorders and such like, and I'm like, mm, this is quite interesting. This was like maybe 1978. And somebody showed me how to turn on a VCS3 and then actually get some sound effects out, out of it. And indeed, um, this sounded like the sound effects I had heard on that mysterious semblance at the Strand of Nightmares track. And to not try it to sound, <laughs> it, I, I was hooked. It was like, wow, this is amazing. I really, there's something going on here that really artistically um, really speaks to me. And quite literally within a month, I'd packed up all my screen printing stuff and I haven't stopped since. What was the next step after that? Did you start gigging? Did you start writing music? You know, what, what was the next outlet for you there? Well, again, at Spectro, it was such a wonderful establishment. I slowly learned over a year or two myself how to use things like the VCS3, how to do tape echo, how to use a mixer, all those sort of things. And I just started to do some tracks and then... I decided to do a concert. They did concerts. You're looking at an audience of maybe 25 or 30 people or so. I was terrified. I mean, just literally terrified. I had to go to the loo and be ill before I could go on and play. I was that nervous. But I just wanted to do it. So 
on stage with uh, tape tape loops and VCS threes. What what could possibly go wrong? Um, but it was good fun. And then I think a little cassette uh, label called Mirage heard about the fact that done these things and approached me and said, do you want to release a cassette? And I'm like, okay. So I recorded a few things in 1980. Uh, images, I think it was, my first little cassette came out. Did another couple of cassettes that did more concerts in the Northeast. Then a little um, local chain of record stores, believe it or not, um, offered to fund me to produce a vinyl record. That was The Climb in 1983, so that kind of takes you up a notch. Then the UK Electronica started, which were more like uh, nation national concert festivals specialising in this kind of music. So I played at the first one of those and a few more after that. And then eventually I started playing abroad and it just kind of escalated. You're, you're kind of known as a man who wears a number of hats. And we'll talk about the record label uh, in a little while. But it, I also, I think I first came across you as a sound designer. So how did that come about and, and is that still, you know, part of what you do? It's a little bit part of what I do now. Um, I mean, after the biochemistry, I worked in a hospital for five years and it just wasn't for me. I just didn't like it. Um, so I basically turned my back on all of that and actually went to work for a little local music store who were doing these, um, the, D, the DX7, the Yamaha DX7 had just come out. In fact, I recall, I think it was one of the first people in the UK to buy one, and I had it at the very first uh, UK Electronic at Milton Keynes in 1983. And I remember the Sounds magazine, uh, the newspaper kind of magazine, kind of um, re reviewed that whole festival. And when it came to my bit, it was like all about the DX7 and the amazing sounds that this was making, not that the fact there was some kind of bloke behind it, actually, who made the sounds and was playing the thing. So I was always kind of into making up my own sounds and indeed this music store that i started to work for they had these things called sky slip roman rams and when one of the very first um sound cartridges for the dx7 so i did that for a while uh, that kind of folded after a while and i had to work on the shop floor which was a bit of a shock and then in 1990 i got a job at akai which was a very good gig to get and I bumped into Ed Stratton from uh, Zero G, Time and Space, I think that might have been called then. Certainly he has Zero G, and he just started putting out these sample libraries, so this may be 92 or so. And he kind of knew I did weird sounds, and he said, well, we're doing these sample libraries. Do you think you would do one? And I, yeah, not knowing how you did this, how you earth you edited it all together, Although, obviously, I had some nice toys with Adaka. I think I edited the first one with a DD-1000, which was certainly beyond my price uh, range, but obviously I could get to lend to one of these things. And that was the Ambient Sample Library, which was maybe 93. I think it was the fourth one ever on their Zero G. So I got in there quite early on, and then I did for a load of other companies. Camel Audio, I did a load of stuff for. Then I got moved over to Apple. I've done a lot of stuff for Sonic Couture in the last few years. So it's something I've always done. And in my own work, I'm always making my own sounds. A lot of the, the, the modular gear I have, it's what you do. I don't do so much commercial sound design these days because there's just so many people are doing it, to be honest. It's interesting you, you mentioned the DX7 because that seems to come up in a lot of people's stories as being a kind of a pivotal moment, you know, some for some more than others. But, you know, that synthesizer uh, and the fact that you know a it was difficult to program so lots of people didn't want to do it and b it had the ability to load new sounds via cartridges kind of launched the whole preset and sound library market didn't it it did yeah i mean it was i mean the first thing when you start using the dx7 there's the, the the filter where's the filter there's no filter so that's 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 the first thing to get over I, I, it is tricky or it was a tricky thing but if you like most things if you spend a bit of time with it but um, I've always seemed to have an ability to make weird sounds. <laughs> I, I just like, I just love sound. Um, music and sound are two interchangeable things for me and um, just something I've always done, I guess. So moving a little forward to 1999, um, you decide to start your own record label. I mean, how how did that all come about? 
Um, <laughs> came about with a pub conversation over a few pints of beer with a friend of mine called Sid Smith, who was a compatriot at Spectro all those years ago. And I, I'd kind of released a few things myself, but they were very sort of here and there. There wasn't really any plan as such. And um, I was a big fan in the 1990s of Fax Records. Um, and I liked the way they brought things out and they had different uh, roster of musicians and there was different uh, coll collaborations. And I kind of liked that style and I just wanted something which had more cohesiveness to it where I could have, a, for want of a better word, a marketing strategy, I suppose. I mean, certainly when I started it out, I didn't have any huge goals for it. I still don't think I have, to be honest. I wasn't, I mean, the, the music we're doing on DIN and that I do is always going to be niche, so it's not going to be huge sales. So there's a lot of love in it, uh, but of course, it's, it is possible to make a little bit of money from it. And I also wanted to have an artistic uh, look, um, I kind of get fed up a lot of the electronic music albums go down the tired path of pictures of space and, and planets, usually badly air, air rendered in some software or other. And I didn't want to have that. I wanted a much more abstract. So the, 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 art, the art look of Din is quite a unique look, I think. And there are no planets or spaceships or sci-fi scenes on these things. It's much more, they're much more pieces of art, I think. Do, do you ever bring your um, artistic bent in terms of the visuals? You know, you, you said earlier that you know that's how you started. Do you ever bring that to bear to any of the releases? Are you involved in any of that kind of stuff? Actually, no, I'm not. I think there's only one of the covers have one of my images, not because somebody actually asked for it. I've always believed that um, something like design, well, there's two things on a cover of a, a CD or a a vinyl album. There's the actual piece of art, the image itself, but the actual the actual design, the font, the way it's laid out. Now I'm not trained at that. Yes, I've got a copy of Photoshop. Yes, I could probably do it, but I would always prefer to use a professional designer. And I've been using um, a couple of German guys, a Bernard Vossenrich, certainly for a lot of years. He's a graphic designer. He knows what he's doing, and he just seems to have. That knack of using just the right font with just the right weight and just the right amount, and it just looks better than what I could do. In terms of the images, we've used a whole host of people. There's, pho there's photographs on there. There's pieces of art. My partner, Wendy, she is a really good photographer and artist. I've used a lot of her images recently, which are kind of close-up images of textures of things. So like the music, it's kind of left up to your imagination. There's a little bit of... Um, um, yeah, I, I guess that's it. It's not specifically giving you an image that this is what it means. It's more of an abstract, leaves it a little bit open to your interpretation. Who do you din sign? or who, how, What's the criteria for an artist to make it onto your label? How, how does that process work? Uh, it has to sound cool. I don't know. It's very, it's very difficult to quantify this. I guess I curate din with my taste. As I said, this is niche um, 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 uh, music. I'm, it's not. It's never going to be mainstream. I'm not trying to rule, take over the world, or sell tens or hundreds of thousands of things. Nice though that would be. One has to be realistic about this. So I guess it's curated with my taste, but I do like to push the uh, boundaries at times. And it's not all about trying to sound like uh, tan like Tangent Dream used to sound like. There's a whole host of artists out there who still seem to be stuck in 1973 sounding try to sound exactly like those guys did and there's no point yes i reference those things sometimes on some of the things i release but there's other releases that are a million miles removed from that and um most of the artists on there i personally know although a few have approached me and it's just i guess you have to trust your instincts i have to use my taste uh, and curate it with a degree of integrity where you think something just works within the parameters that I've set out. I mean, it's, it is kind of vague. You just go where you got. If somebody goes to the Bandcamp page uh, for for Din, you'll see that there are, I think, Nevermore, which we'll talk about in a moment, is the 69th 
release on you know like the major sort of title releases but then you've got other releases on the label one of which is called tone science which is very interesting a lot of people um mention it uh, as, as quite an influential or inspirational uh batch of recordings can you tell me a little bit about to- the tone science concept well tone science initially was a solo album that i put out and um it was very experimental it was uh an, an aleatoric composition. What I mean by that, there's air randomness in there. The, I, I used mainly the surge system I have, but other things like the Roland 100M, um, all 100% analog self-playing patches where it's an incredibly complex patch where effectively the composition is the patch, which took me two or three days to get to work. It's not just noise, it's actually in a mode, a scale, and it basically plays itself. And it's random in the way that water is. If you if you look at a, a stream or you watch the the sea coming up on the shore, it kind of always looks the same, but it never actually is exactly ever the same. So if you put enough things into the patch, if it's complex enough, it will probably never exactly repeat itself. It's kind of static in a way. It doesn't develop like a composition where a human being would be playing it. It just does its thing. But I released that, is in, it, it, it kind of split my fan base, I guess, down the middle. Some people went, wow, this is really interesting, we really like this. And other people went, where's the sequences? <laughs> they, were, they were very confused by it. And that was out for a couple of years, and I did get a lot of good reaction. And I was quite happy to put it out. It was something very, di- very different. And then the whole modular thing, I mean, I've never stopped using um, modular since. I, I first bought a Roland... System 100M in 1982 to use on the climb, and I've still got the original five, the the original rack of that. Obviously, during the 1990s, these things were appearing in skips. People just didn't want to use them at all. Uh, All the digital synths, and you could recall things in computers. Why would you want to use an analog modular synth where you couldn't store what you had, and you know it could have noise and hiss and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, the um, Eurorack format has really exploded, certainly in the last five to ten years. So I'm sitting there going, hmm, that's quite interesting. Why don't I do a series where I invite modular artists from all sorts, not just the new uh, generation, but maybe some of the older artists as well to reinterpret what they do, use some artists who are very experienced, also invite some artists who are just starting out and get them to do um, a five, six, seven minute track just using modular synths. So no keyboards, no digital synths, no digital reverb, just just using modular synths. Um, and I would curate the running order of these, and that would be Tone Signs uh, vo- Volume 1. And then there's Volume 2, we're up to Volume 5, and I'm almost finishing Volume 6 now. And the, there really have been, I think, a really lovely showcase for that whole genre or sub-genre of the electronic mu- uh, music world at least i hope so we mentioned earlier that you know bandcamp is your your kind of shop window how has the internet and services like bandcamp benefited a, a label such as din well bandcamp is wonderful i mean bandcamp flies the flag for independent musicians artists and uh, record and uh, it, it, it's it's really a one-off in that you see you have to talk about the streaming side of things and you have to wonder, why would somebody who can, for £10 a month, if they want to have ad, ad free, or even they can have it for free if they want to have adverts coming in, they can have Spotify and they can have a listen to a million, billion, trillion tracks for free or £10 a month. Why would a person therefore go into Bandcamp and buy one album as a digital download for £7? And then, or whatever price it is, and you get a lot of people going, well, there's, there's no point. And you go, well, actually, there is, because the person who buys the music like that of Bandcamp actually cares for the musicians and artists. They actually want to directly support them. They like their music enough to think that it's worth them playing, paying that. That's not to belittle people who listen on Spotify. That's fine if you want to listen that way, you can, but it's well documented that none of us are ever going to get very rich very quickly, very quickly, unless you've got a billion tr- trillion players through a major record l- uh, label. Um, so Bandcamp is a platform where um, people who love whatever genre of music, not just electronic music, all genres of music, can directly support their, op- their artists that they love by either buying a download or they can actually buy physical stuff on there. I can sell CDs and 
T-shirts and vinyl and, and whatever. And it's fantastic in terms of the things that it'll allow you to do I couldn't have dreamed about in 1980 or so when I started out. So, for example, if somebody buys online in the middle of the night while I'm fast asleep a vinyl record that may take a week to ship or to post to them, they can also immediately, like literally immediately, have a digital download of that album so they can listen to that whilst it's in the post. I mean, that's like, it's science fiction almost. It's so cool. Um there's other things like over time you build up a list of um, followers on Bandcamp. Um, then has got several thousand on there and when a new release comes out or if I've got something to say, an offer or whatever, or concerts coming up, I can let those people know via a message and it's instantaneous within the not much more time than it takes me to type that message out and press and go. If I do a concert, say, in, in Manchester or, or Birmingham, if I have got one in Birmingham coming up soon, I can send a message not to all the Bankham followers, because if somebody's in the States, a concert in Birmingham's not much use to them. Um, I can say I only want to send messages to the Bankham followers within 100 miles or 200 miles of, uh, of that uh, city. So it's, it's very, very, I think it's very good, and a lot of people do su support it, which is, ec is excellent. Yeah, and I think also when people buy from Bandcamp, they do so because, I certainly do, because I know that the artist and the label get the majority of that money and it's not split and, you know, sent over, you know, record labels, various divisions, you know, it, more of that, I, I guess, goes into your pocket. Well, it does, yes. I mean, obviously, it, it, it doesn't stop a major record label being on Bandcamp, but I don't think the majors will. But um, as, as a record label, uh, Bandcamp take a relatively small percentage. I think it's 10 to 15%, a little bit for PayPal, I suppose, and the rest goes to you. And then I can share it out with the artists. And it's certainly you can make more. There's been these Bandcamp Fridays where they've actually even uh, waived the Bandcamp fee to... Um, uh, get people to go and buy the, the uh, pieces of music more to support it more and I think that's really worked well although it means all your sales kind of tend to come in one day and not for the rest of the month which is a bit of a bugbear sometimes but 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 yes it's it's a very good system and it, it really isn't it really stands alone I hope nothing happens to it because there's nothing quite like it to be honest So let's get to the 100th DIN release, which is, is why we're here today. It launched at the beginning of October, and it's called Nevermore, and it's the 100th release on the label, even though the catalogue number, I think, is 69, if I'm not mistaken. I will explain this if you wish. If you wouldn't mind, that would be fantastic. Yeah, okay. So the DIN 69 is the main record label, and that means there's been 69 um, CDs out. Some of them are on vinyl, but more mainly on CDs. Yes, Din still believes in CDs, folks. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't dead yet. Uh, but there is a sub-label called Din DDL, which DDL quite tr trickly means digital down down download, and that is that is down that is digital only um, albums. And there's been twenty six of those, and then there's the five Tone Science albums. And I think if you add those all up, you'll find it comes to one hundred. So what was the inspiration behind Nevermore and was there a reason that this was chosen as the 100th release? I'm sure the fact that I'm on it's a complete coincidence. Um, it was, well, obviously you know, there's been a pandemic as we all know. Uh, certainly last year I had something like six, seven concerts lined up. They all got cancelled, which was a great shame. Although in the, in the great scheme of things, concerts cancelled is, is not that big a deal compared to what some people have had to endure. But um, uh, a very famous uh, ambient musician called Steve Roach from the States set up um, um, this uh, three-day online festival called SoundQuest in, I think it was in, in March. And uh, I've, I've known Steve a little bit over the years, and he got in touch with me and asked me if I would play a set, uh, an hour-long set. And I said, yes, I, I would record this set. It wasn't streamed live because there was people from all over the world. It was recorded here in advance. And then I'd sent over the video to Steve and his team. And then over the, over the three uh, nights and days that this event was on, these concerts and other people's were streamed. And I think 
during my performance over the weekend, he got up to almost, I think it was over a thousand people online on YouTube at, at once at one stage, which is fantastic. Um, I, 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 I thought, well, I want to record what I'm, 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 I'm doing because I'd tried out lots of new ideas. I didn't want to use a laptop. I used just the um, uh, modular gear. I used the big surge, Eurorack stuff. I used my French connection on the Martino analog keyboard, the Moog, Cog uh, uh, Summit, a few keyboards like that, a few effects. So I multi-tracked it, went through a nice mixer, and I multi-tracked to do a hard disk drive, and that meant... Uh, I. I, it was a complete live rec 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 recording, and that as I, I just played for an hour, it, it kind of moved through different phases and uh, moods. Uh, but I had a multi-track recording of it, so I could get a much better mix. And then I kind of thought, hmm, this has come out quite well. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I should release this at some point in time. When should I release it? Oh, well, look, the one hundredth release will be coming up in the uh, the autumn. So, um, yeah, that <laughs> seemed like a good. A good opportunity for me to blow my trumpet for once. And <laughs> the music on Nevermore. Where, where does that come from? Was it uh, was it improvised partially or totally? Uh, was there much of a composition process before you did that performance? It was a bit of both. Um, I mean, I'm using, I mean, some of the uh, modular synthesizers these days are very sophisticated. In terms of I had um, one of the, the 1010 Bitbox micros in there, so I had sa samples in there, which were sounds I'd prepared ahead of time, just various loops and things. And I had various uh, sequences stored in various play places, I had various, it was a complex patch. I mean, you're looking at a lot of modular gear here with lots of voices that I could bring in and out. But the actual performance was improvised. I've got recordings of it as practices and they're never quite the same. It never comes out the same twice. In fact, a, a really um, a lovely um, point in time came in the what became the title track when I was actually doing it. I didn't know it was going to be called Nevermore. I didn't have the titles at that time. They often come out later. And... I was playing this solo. I don't, I don't know if you know about the French Connection keyboard, the analog system French Connection, which mimics the Ons Martino in terms of if you've got a wire on, on the right hand, and that is like glisses over the pitch. And you've got a rocker switch on the left hand, which usually control the volume and also maybe filtering stuff. But you can actually get it to play just the regular keyboard. And I, I switched this so I was playing the regular keyboard with my right hand playing a lead line whilst using the rocker switch to make the volume go in and out. And I, I came up with a theme, a really lovely theme, on the title track that I never played during the rehearsals. It just happened there and then. And you can almost see me, I mean, I've got my back, you can see me playing, you can almost see me going, huh, I quite like this. <laughs> I'm going to play this a few more times. And uh, it was one of those things that, which sometimes those things only happen when you play live. And although there wasn't a physical audience there, I was so lost in what I was doing. It was still a nice, a nice point in time. I've seen you play um, that instrument. Uh, I saw it at Synthfest. Uh, I think it was probably the last time that there was a physical uh, Synthfest, so that must be 2019, I think. I think it might. I think Leon's Martin had it the first one. It was oh, actually right, the yeah. first one. Yeah, because I remember seeing you. It is fascinating. It really is because it's this. It's very unique sound and a very unique playing style. Is that something that that you kind of um, gravitate to? You know, odd machines that play things in a non-conformist way you know rather than your traditional western keyboards that kind of thing yeah i i, I guess so it, it's it's i've had it for about gosh i must have had it about 12 years now i was doing research on it and i i work with a, um an american musician called robert rich who um is sort of a compatriot steve roach and robert uh you often uses a pedal steel guitar with a um, he plays in a very gliss-like style. It has this beautiful, well, it's a gliss sound. You can you, you can you can use a, a, a bottle top on it and pedals, and it's got a beautiful, almost like a female voice sound. And I thought, yeah, yeah it'd be really nice to have a, a synth for keyboard that could do that. But how could, how do you do gliss on a keyboard? Well, the theremin is obviously one way, but it's notoriously difficult to play. And the Ons Martin is this beautiful instrument from around about the same time the theremin was originally invented. 
late 1920s. And the Analog Systems French Connection, I think it was Johnny Greenwood from uh, um, Radiohead who commissioned them to do these because they were using uh, Ons Martinos and he wanted a one that he could use if he's modular gear live. And um, it's, it has this amazing ability to um, do this perfect total gliss on a keyboard because you're right, your fingers in a, in a metal ring on a, a wire on pulleys, which you, you, you move up and down in front of the keyboard. So it's easier to get your pitch right compared with uh, um, theremin. Although I still usually have a little guitar tuner there to keep this in, in, in check because it can drift sometimes. But it's lovely. If you want to put vibrato, you just waggle your finger. And if you want fast, you want fast vibrato, you waggle your finger faster. It's like playing a string instrument. It's like, uh, you know, a, a, um, a cello or something. That's how you play that. If you want vibrato, you, 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 you waggle your finger. So it's that immediate physical contact and as i said the left hand has a, a rocker switch you don't use a conventional en envelope you are the envelope you make the volume go up or down in going back to the cello for example sometimes a good ch a cellist can put uh, so much emotion into one note they can hold a note for a long time but by varying the dynamics the vibrato the tone of what they play on that one note and it's quite difficult doing that just on a synth but on the Ons Martin keyboard, I can do that. And it's very expressive. And it does also give me, a, I guess, a slightly unique... Oh, is there such a thing as a slightly unique voice? What I mean is I'm sure there's a few other people using these things, but I haven't heard that many people use it. Uh, and you can also go wild. You can do some crazy sound effects and big glissandos and all sorts of things. So it's a... It, it looks. It also looks good live. I mean, when you play live, I like it to be entertainment. It has to be entertaining. And um, whether you like it or not, sitting behind a laptop isn't the most entertaining thing to watch. Whereas when you see people do physical things on stage, I th always think it has more of a connection with uh, the audience. Do you find um, the degree of expression or maybe the lack of degree of expression in modern synthesizers quite frustrating? For many years, there were not many synths that had those kind of features. It was keyboard and knobs and that was it. Are you uh, a big fan of um, expressive synthesizers? It depends. It depends on what you want to do. Um, it's neither better or worse than a non-expressive synthesizer. If you want to be really cold and dry and have a craft work, you can, can kind of vibe. The very lack of expression is what makes it cool. So it's not all about... It's, it, the, the music should drive what you do not the other way around. Although we all know technology has a huge effect on what you can produce. I've always believed that the music should drive what you do. So if you want to be expressive, something like the Jans Martin or French Connection is a wonderful thing. If you want to do really cold, hard, um, an, an, analog beats, maybe you don't need that expression because you need something really tight. You know, things being absolutely nailed down to the beats sometimes can be an excite, exciting thing. Do you plan to do any more uh, of these live performances and record them and release them as an album in, in future dim releases? Possibly. Um, I did another couple of smaller streams. In fact, um, there is another album coming out in November, if I may talk about this, because it has a very unique thing about it. We all know about the VCS-3, and I mentioned about the VCS-3. For those who don't know, it's that weird L-shaped thing with what looks like a little battleship's pinboard on it. Uh, much beloved of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop for Doctor Who sound effects and was the first synth I ever used, in fact, in Spectro in 1978, 1979. I picked up one for, I'm not going to tell you how embarrassingly cheap it was in 1993. It's certainly worth a few quid more than that now, but I've done an album which where I just used the VCS-3. It's notoriously difficult to keep, to keep in tune and with a little few tricks and a lot of patience and time and multi-tracking, of course, it's just the VCS-3. I did use some sound effects like, uh, or, or effects units like tape echo, spring reverb, uh, 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 an analog phaser. There was a few helping hands from um, Eurorack things like sequences, LFOs, envelopes, but no sounds. The only sounds come from the VCS-3. And that was quite a challenge to, uh, to do. So that, that's going to come out on a, um, a Greek label putting that on a vinyl release. I'm going to do a digital version of that with two extra tracks which were from live streams. What 
what's been your favourite DIN release over over the the last twenty two years? I know it's it's like picking your favourite child, but the, the, is there one that really stands out to you as either you know maybe that was the most successful or the most uh, satisfying release uh, that you've ever put out? That's an all well. It is an impossible question. It depends whether it's one of the titles that I'm on, or just a solo one, or whether one of the other artists. I really could not pick out one, but I suppose you're going to make me so. Axiom, which was Din sixty four, my last studio album, in a way, is a distillation of everything I've done. So it's it was out on vinyl as well. So it's only about forty two minutes long. Three tracks per side it's very analog i use lots of modular the uh, matriarch the move matriarch which i love and i went overboard in terms of recording everything from the analog um, uh, modulars there's a few plugins but not very many and it just seems to be especially the track uh, omicron which opens that album just if, if if you had to play one track by me omicron the opening track of axiom listen to that first so what are the plans for the next 100 releases from Din? Uh, have you Is that future mapped out, or are you just playing it by ear? Uh, well, you know, it took me 22 years. I mean, my, uh, I won't tell you how old well, I'm 62 now, so that would make me 84. Gosh, well, you know, it's not impossible. Maybe I can do it a little bit quicker than that. I don't know. It's not getting any easier to run an independent music record label with putting out niche records and CDs. It's, it's just not getting any easier. Whether we like it or not, fewer people are buying physical things, vinyl being an exception, but even that's becoming more difficult with all the delays because now the major record companies are going, oh, we'll have a bit of that, so we're going to flood all our things into there so the small independents have no chance of getting their vinyl records any time in the next nine months. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to see. The internet's changed everything so much. Who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15, 20 years? I'll just keep doing I don't think I'll ever stop doing music at all. I can't ever see me doing that. Whether I want to do it uh, as a record label or whatever, I don't know. Time will tell. I'll just take one step at a time and then try and enjoy what I'm doing, even after 40 odd years of doing this stuff. And what's coming up in your immediate future in terms of performances? You, you mentioned a, a gig coming up in Birmingham soon. Um, have you got any other plans? Uh, not that, you know, it's probably not the most ideal time to make plans. Well, it, it hasn't been. Obviously, all the concerts last year were cancelled. The one in Birmingham at the Seventh Wave Festival, um, I'll be playing that. Um, that's just almost like just dipping dip my toe, getting back into actually playing live. Uh, I'm going to do it with a, uh, just the um, uh, modular system and the Moog, I think. I'll have a relatively small setup for that. Possible concert uh, next year in Liverpool at the Capstone again, I hope. There's a possible concert in the States, but everything, you just don't want to say too much. You don't want to commit too much because it's still a little bit up in the air. Um in terms of DIN, I think I mentioned before, this, I'm getting to the point of being able to finalise the running order on Tone Sign 6 um, after DIN 69's DIN 70. And right the way back to that meeting I had with Sid in the pub, I always had this idea that every 10th album there would be a, um, a sampler album of the previous nine discs. And I call them index, as like a din, an anagram. There's something going on there. I must have worked all this out in ahead of time. So I'm going to stick to that plan. So din 70 will be index 07, and that will be a sample album of din 61 to 69. Couple of other things planned for din releases next year, but I don't want to say anything quite yet because it's a little too early to spill the beans on those. And just basically keep going. Just keep keep going. Indeed. And just final question. Um, You've got a, a, a fair amount of gear in your studio. Then, what's your favourite thing at the moment? What's really inspiring you uh, to make more, you know, more music? Well, I'll answer it in two ways. And the first way is a bit of a sticky way, really. In that, for me, all the gear together behaves as one huge instru 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 instrument. So, quite often, they're all interacting together. So, but that's a bit cheeky, really. I think the Moog Ma uh, Matriarch. I bought that relatively recently, and that's a lovely keyboard. Uh, it's. I just find it, although it's not true polyphonic, it's uh, paraphonic, 
even that means when you play chords, strange things can happen with the order of the notes, so you're never quite sure what's going to happen. And it has a lovely warm sound, whether I like it or not, and I do like it. My musical he um, her her heritage is from the analog days. That's what appeals to me. So yeah, I've got nothing against digital synths, and I use plugins where I need uh, pl plugins, but my heart is always going to be in the analog domain. Fantastic. Ian, congratulations on 100 DIN releases, and, and here's to many more. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Before you go, make sure you visit the Sound on Sound podcast page at soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts, where you can explore all the other great content playing across the other channels. I'm Rob Puricelli, and this has been a failed Muso production for Sound on Sound. <laughs>